Hello, and welcome to the Trail Manners Podcast. I'm your host, Eric Manning, coming to you from the beautiful trails in Ogden, Utah, but connecting you to wherever trail, ultra, and mountain running takes us. We'll bring trail running to life with amazing athletes, discuss the latest topics, epic journeys, and get you stoked for your next trail adventure. We're sharing the moments that make life special, because even a rough day on the trail beats a good day indoors, and nothing beats time spent with good friends and great stories. Catch us here weekly for your dose of dirt, hurt, and good vibes. So now, it's time to top off your water, grab some cheese curds, and join us for this week's podcast, where we take you deep into the heart of our sport. It's go time. Hello and welcome to episode number 315 of the Trail Matters Podcast. Our guest today is Mr. Will Franz, and we will be talking nutrition. The Trail Matters Podcast is produced for your enjoyment, and show notes are found at trailmanners.com. Come back often and feel free to add the podcast to your favorite RSS feed or iTunes. You can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Trail Manners. And don't forget to subscribe, review, and rate us on iTunes. If you're so inclined, Trail Manners would really appreciate any contribution to our Patreon account at patreon.com backslash trail manners. All links from the show notes. Now let's get after it. All right, welcome back to the Trail Manners podcast. As you heard, it's episode 315. We are back with a, uh, a new guest, somebody you haven't heard from on our show before, and someone I just met today in person. Um, he is, we are here to talk nutrition. I've got Will Franz on. Did I get that right? Yeah, you got that right. All right. So so we're going to sit here and we're going to talk about some nutrition stuff. But before we get started, um, even for our listeners, let's let's get a little bit of background of who you are, you know, where you came from and what you're doing. Cool. Uh, yeah, my name is Will. And I am a nutrition coach, personal trainer, ultra running coach. And I originally from New Mexico and I kind of grew up in a mix between New Mexico and Pennsylvania and went to school in Arizona, studied philosophy and was like looking to be looking to be a lawyer and decided not to go that route wow. for a wide range of reasons, mostly because I did a couple summers in a law office and decided I wanted to spend a lot more time outside. <laughs> <laughs> and um, post-school, uh, like I got, I ended up moving to Korea and teaching English and ended up in Utah because I decided I wanted to teach snowboarding for some reason. Oh, wow. Ended up not doing that either uh (laughs) i worked a winter as a lifty and then like drove snow cats for the past like five or six years so that's kind of what i've been doing here as far as the like athletic side in my teen years i was like i was fairly overweight but always like in sports and did a bunch of diets to control things because you know nope it sucks it just sucks to be overweight and then when i was 20 i finally found like some stuff that worked be it like intermittent fasting and whatever for a short period of time and i played fairly competitive ultimate frisbee and um, got really into cycling and did all that and when i was 20 yeah 26 um my dad died and I got really into like the health sphere, right? So like something like that's going to kind of drive you into yeah. learning more about health and nutrition, all this stuff and ended up just diving down a rabbit hole. Like I've had a realization fairly recently that I'm probably like somewhere on like far, like functional end of the autism spectrum. So when I get into something, I really get, get into something <laughs> um, and ended up just like diving deep and did personal training stuff and nutrition for a little bit and ended up working at a gym down in Salt Lake called Wasatch Fitness Academy, where I still work. And they tend to cater to a lot of like outdoor athletes. So I ended up like doing nutrition for some ultra runners and someone who's trying to like climb Everest and all this endurance stuff and found a knack for it. And as I dove deeper, like I just kept not necessarily liking everything I was seeing. So I kept just diving and learning and diving and learning. And now I'm coaching people to run really far and kind of fell in love with it myself recently. So. Nice. Well, I mean, it sounds interesting too, because, and you, you could speak on this as well, but when, did you find when you got into, you know, that training part where it's kind of the outdoor athletes, was it 
in your eyes, kind of a similar mindset, but also a different mindset than maybe other types of athletes? Yeah, it can be. I mean, I think there's like a few ends there. So like there, you and I were just talking, there isn't like an Olympic end goal or anything like that. So there's very much a love of the sport for it Mm -hmm. that I always really appreciated playing ultimate. Like there's, there's a competitive scene now, but when I started, like it was still very much like club teams and you're not, you're not getting paid. So (laughs) like (laughs) no Frisbee sponsors. No, not really. Like now people are making a ton of money uh, for it. If you're, especially if you're in disc golf, but like I, I really like that. I like being outdoors. Like I like people who do really hard stuff. That's always really spoken to me. So just kind of the general appeal to it. And then another thing on the ultra end that's like really different is, God, I swear it's like 12 sports in one, like a 50 K and a six day -er are not the same. Yeah. And yet they're all an ultra marathon. Right. So like you shouldn't fuel them or train them necessarily the same. So it's just like the, there's this appeal to it being difficult to train that I, I really liked. So when you said you were about 26 when you kind of mm-hmm. dove in the rabbit hole, yeah. um, I mean, it's gonna, it's gonna it's almost like asking your age, but how, how long ago was that? Like how many years ago did you just dive in? Yeah, I'm 32, so okay. six years ago. Okay. And I've always loved food. Um, I started training heavily when I was 20, so okay. I've kind of been in this, but the rabbit hole is like, six ish years ago so let me ask you this because i think this is sets it up for us. so just in the last six years there's been a lot that have, has gone on in the nutrition world and i'm not yeah. talking just for athletes right oh yeah i mean it used to be like there were three diets right there was mm-hmm. like the mediterranean there was all these like different like <laughs> books and trends and whatever they could be but now it's just like every time i look there's a new one no carb, low carb, fasting, yeah. some other type of fasting, some other type of, you know, thing. And then also, you know, what happened even more, and I'm not going to say just in the past six years, but we keep see it trending is just like allergens, right? Gluten, you know, all yeah. these other things. So there's a lot, when you're in that rabbit hole, there's just a lot more information, yeah. right? That you've really got to dissect through because mm-hmm. I think what we're seeing is what works for somebody here off to the, this side doesn't work for somebody else, yep. right? Based on so many factors. And I think to me, that's why everything in this sport to me is, I think nutrition is the, is that moving target, but also that gem. If you can, if you can dial that in, it's like having the golden, golden egg. Yeah. I mean, I think stat I saw is like, a, a large number of DNFs at least had for, like 40% of them, I think, had nutrition as a, a factor. Might mm-hmm. not have been the only factor, but somewhere in there. And then, God, well over 50% of athletes lose some training every year in this sport due to injury. And most of that, I think, comes down to either you're going too hard too fast and like following a training plan that you have no business doing, or you aren't recovering. And that's probably more common so if you're not getting the food in then you're ending up with these problems <laughs> and that's kind of where where you end up in this space like a unless you're really trying to be like top peak best of best like your exact intervals or hill repeats don't matter as much as getting this volume and then being able to recover from whatever you're doing and if we're not recovering you can't actually get where you need to go so yeah well, and I saw like for just in the ultra running well realm for so long, there was not nearly as many races, right? For, for a long yeah. time, there was like, you had these a races and they were pretty similar. Your hundred milers were pretty much like the grand slamish type races. Mm-hmm. And I think now where there's more and more races, people want to race more and more. Oh, right. Yeah. So they look at it. And it's like, well, I don't want to miss that. And next month I'm doing that. And then the next month I'm doing <laughs> that. And again, it's fun. Yeah. Right. And people love it. And I, I mean, I'm one of those people, you know, that I'm like, oh, I'm going to sign up for that and not realize it's, you know, a race in February where it's, I got to train all winter and hardcore or whatever. So, yeah. but I think that also is that thing that's that fine line of overtraining, mm-hmm. not fueling properly, but the fear of missing out, right? You, yeah. you want to be with your friends. Hey, man, I'm running this race. You want to come with me? Yeah, why not? You yeah. know, I got a couple extra days and, you know, nothing else to do. So, with the with the nutrition change, there's also a pretty big trend in the sport of just more and more options, right? You see sure. a lot of the, the older school races, like, say, a Squaw Peak 50 here in Utah that used to, you know, be sold out day one and yep. now it's sold out right before the race almost sometimes Got it. Um, because there's just so many options yeah right? i mean 
You could literally race weekly if you wanted to. Oh, easy. Oh, yeah. easy. Yeah. And I'm, I mean, not just five Ks, but just like big, cool, awesome races yeah. um, all over the place. And that's kind of the other lure to it, you know, but I, it, but I would, I would say I've gotten way ahead of myself in one realm because, you know, Will showed up with uh, cheese curds, <laughs> cheese curds and IPAs. So hello. And the funny thing is for those listening, that the IPA I have in my hand is a Kirkland Citra Hop Session IPA, and I was actually wanted to try these at our local uh, what is that the Costco, but you have to buy a bunch because you're at Costco, so it's yep. like a 48 pack. It's probably 24, but yeah, it's I'm 24 like, pack. Yeah, which is like, still a, a commitment. Yeah, <laughs> and that's what I'm thinking. I'm like, if I don't like that, <laughs> that's gonna be long. That's gonna be long 12 <laughs> days because I'll drink two a day. But yeah, um, it's one I would actually have. Yeah. It's not like. Top five, but it's definitely not the bottom of the rung. I see this as a pretty – actually, I see this as more of a solid summer beer. Yeah. It's a little bit lighter hop, mm-hmm. not super strong or dark. It's not a hazy. And uh, mm-hmm. one thing I love with my IPAs, and it says it on here, um, lemon drop hops. Yeah. You know, just a little bit of lemon. So, you know, hats off to you for bringing me cheese curds and beer. <laughs> I mean, just all, automatically we became best friends. <laughs> um, I mean – I'm all about food, man. If you if you have a food passion, I'm more than happy to feed it. Yeah, so. I, I think passion is one word you could use for what you brought me, um, but it's definitely two that I'm absolutely known for. Yeah. Um, I think on my tombstone there'll be a, a, a etching of a hop on one side and a cheese curd on the other, <laughs> and I would welcome that. So if anybody, if I get to that point, and anybody's listening, that's what I want. I mean, I love the training stuff, but I had also been considered being a cook for a while. Like, I just love food. It's really yeah. how I felt, felt deep into this, and it doesn't matter as much to most people here, so it's not a big factor. But, like, I cook, I eat. Like, it's what I, I do. So. I eat, and I love food, and that shows a little more than I like sometimes. Me too. Um, but well, so let's get into it. So nutrition, right? I mean, yeah. um, you know, there's just so much going on and there's some amazing, amazing athletes getting amazing results with different types of nutrition back. Um, I shouldn't say, but, uh, say dieting sure. or, um, I don't even like to say in that word. Um, a nutrition I mean, we, plan. Yeah, I mean, right? we, can, we can. Like, we can classify diet as, like, what you eat. Yeah. Right? But, yeah, absolutely. I think when people I, hear I'm diet, they're like, lose weight. Oh, I'm going to lose all I'm yeah. lose 50 pounds in five days. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah so, <no. laughs> but it's like a nutrition yeah. plan. And, you know, we've seen people, you know, when Joel Hatch, uh, the co-host, being on the show, I mean, mm-hmm. there's a big trend. We talked a lot about the paleo, the whole yep. food 30. Um, yep. You know, it's what's a little cleaner eating, you mm-hmm. know. Um, that way we've seen, you know, obviously paleo side, we've seen fasting, you know, different types of fasting, you know, I mean, there's inter- intermittent and I swear every time I turn around, there's a new type of fasting. Um, yes. And there's also, um, you know, there's a big one going on now, kind of that no carb to low carb yep. um, in the running community. So let's just jump in and just let's, let's talk about some of these because I know there's a lot of people that, you know, either getting into running and, and I could be wrong. I'm not, I don't have your background. Sure. I'm not a science guy. I read, I talk to people, but I just really believe that there's not one magic way to do this, right? Because yeah. I look at all of them to me and they should be more of a lifestyle thing. And I think that, yeah. you know, when we talk about nutrition for a race is one thing, but at the same time, you've got to have your, your daily nutrition and your yeah. training nutrition. And when you're not training and we, we talked before the show started about cycling on your nutrition. Yeah. So, you know, let's kind of, let's jump into that. What have you seen right now as kind of in your eyes, what's kind of the buzz, the buzz, what's the hot topic that you see that I'm going to, I'm going to put you on the spot, which is the one thing you see that kind of makes your brain go, Oh my gosh, like almost drives you nuts as someone that dove into this realm. Yeah. So we're going to put like a, a larger blanket statement. We can dive deeper on any of these things, but the one thing I see, and it's not just ultra athletes, right? Like I've, I've seen this um, historically in CrossFit. I've seen it across the board. It is trying to apply a lifestyle diet to a performance space or vice versa. Okay. Right. And if you are, I think the one thing we should really recognize with ultra athletes is at some point throughout your year, you're probably having at least a 10 hour training week, right? Oh like, yeah. Probably more. Yeah. But like we can at least accept that. And that is an insane amount of training. <laughs> like that is not a thing that a recreational athlete does in another space. Like I was a very competitive, like I got to the finals and nationals and Frisbee in uh, Korea. And I mean, it's not the most competitive in the world, but I was still training hard, maybe topped out at a 10 hour week. Yeah. Like now, 
if you want to even like get in the miles to run a 50 miler, like you have to hit that probably at some point. Yeah. So you are training to a degree that a like semi-professional athlete would in a lot of other sports. Yeah. And as a result, like you're probably, you are going to need to periodize your nutrition a little bit. It shouldn't be the same all the time. And depending on what your training looks like, it's going to look a little different. Depending where you are in your year, it's going to look a little different. Your race day nutrition should not be the same as your daily nutrition. Um, and if we're not shifting that around a little bit, it's kind of an issue. So, like, one of the things I see a lot of is a low-carb approach. And I, mm. <laughs> I hate that term because um, it's meaningless, right? So, like, keto means a thing. It means you're eating... <coughs> low enough carbs to produce ketones from your liver. Um, low carb can mean anything from like 20 a day to a hundred grams. Like <laughs> it means don't eat any rice. I don't know. Like, <laughs> I've seen so many fucking <laughs> definitions of this. Like I can't even, it drives me crazy as you can tell. So like a low carb approach is fine for health. It is a, it is a health diet most of the time. Um, because if you eat excess anything, you end up with inflammation. Mm -hmm. And inflammation is key to like everything from heart disease to pick a thing, diabetes, yeah. whatever, yeah. right? Um, but when you're training as an athlete, if you want to be able to push hard, if you want to be able to like have this extra burst of speed, having some carbs in your system helps. It's not necessary. Your body will make them. They're that important, but it's helpful. The real thing they do is they help you recover. So like post a big training session, if you have some carbohydrates, it will get you ready for another training session the next day. It'll also regulate your cortisol so you're not stressed all the time. So a like no carb approach feels kind of nutty to me for most people. Yeah. Some people do okay on it. Um, but it's a little, little off most of the time. And then if you are going to do like a lower carb approach, I like it to be very strategic, mm -hmm. right? So do you know who Chris Froome is? Uh, no. He won the Tour de France like five, six years okay. ago, something like that. And he did it on a keto diet. He was also eating 300 plus grams of carbohydrates a day because when you're burning 6,000 calories a day, you can do that and still stay in ketosis. And this is kind of like where the low carb thing is weird to me. Like we're using a very vague potentially harmful diet to work in a performance space when it wasn't built for that. Yeah. Cause there is a difference. I mean, like you said, between a no carb and a low carb yeah. and a keto, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's your, your three realms. And I think sometimes we, I don't want to say we bunch them together. I think yeah. people, but like you said, what does low mean? Yeah. Right. So what's, uh, you know, fast, it's the same sure. thing. What's fast? Well, yeah. you know, What's what's a fast hundred mile time? It's like, well, you got to give me the course. For me, it would be finishing. Yeah, right. right? So like, but I but I think yeah. but but I think it's true to that. Is yeah. I think we're trying, and I like I like it to a degree. I think as athletes, you're always trying to get the edge, right? Whatever that is for you, you yeah. know, whether it's a training block, whether it's food, whether it's a supplement, whether it's training like strength training, whether mm -hmm. it's mind training, whether it's you know whatever it is. I think yeah. everybody's trying to find that edge for them. Great. Right? And I think the nutrition side that I've seen has been the biggest explosion. Yeah. And not that it hasn't been around. We've talked about that, that, you know, a lot of these things have been around for a long time. Yeah. But I think now they're just being more brought to light based on what we're doing. Right. Yeah. Um, so when you talk about, uh, um, you know, recovery. So here's a good mm -hmm. one. Like why then? And maybe I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put you on the spot. Yeah. Why when people say, oh, after a race, after a thing, I drink chocolate milk and I just feel like recovered, right? I feel like sure. I'm not as sore the next day. Yeah. So what's chocolate milk do for you? Yeah, so I actually read a study on this like two days ago. Okay, perfect. I think it's like called chocolate milk for as a recovery aid. Um, for There's this traditional wisdom that as a recovery agent, you want something that is like a one to four ratio of protein to carbohydrate. And chocolate milk pretty much hits that to a T. Okay. Um, there's enough sugar in it to get some carbohydrate. There's some protein in there as well. And it has that really good ratio. I don't think it's the best thing you could yeah. be ingesting. Um, I think it's the easiest though, right? It's Probably because it's super handy. You can like, get it anywhere. <laughs> the main, absolutely. The main reason like, I don't think it's the best thing you can be ingesting is actually nothing to do with health. It's that like 
to get enough protein to really instigate that recovery, then you were going to have to probably drink a half gallon of it, okay. right? Like it is, but the ratio is really good. You'd probably be better off having some kind of protein shake with some extra carbohydrate in there um, to make that balance. But that's why it's it's touted as that because of this like beautiful perfect ratio. And I will also say for anybody listening, like the four to one is designed for very high level athletes, right? So like I'm not pushing that hard. I can't. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm not that good. Yeah. So, like mine is probably closer to two to one, maybe three on a really heavy day, but. That's where that came from. So then, like, say a Scratch Labs recovery drink. Uh, yeah. You know, there's other reco- companies out there. I mean, I, I've used Scratch before. Sure. You've got First Endurance, who has a great one. Um, and then there's, like, a lot of other brands don't market them as mm-hmm. a recovery, but it's a protein drink. Yeah. Right? So would you look at those based on – I mean, I know they're all different, probably different recipes, but probably pretty similar. Do you look at those as better than chocolate milk because they probably have a little more, say, science to them? Yeah, I mean, they might be – a little better um they're they're probably a little more effective in many ways they're also probably four times as expensive right oh, yeah. so it's like that's kind of what what that comes down to yeah i mean for me i i mean why do you need to recover your drink at all would be the one thing like running is what we'd call catabolic it tears your muscles apart that's what it does um any activity does but running really like has a has a very tear down effect <clears throat> So when you're done, if you want to recover, you kind of want to instigate that early. Yeah. And the two things you do to ha- make that happen are start to replenish your glycogen with carbs and try to instigate muscle protein synthesis. You try to like get your protein systems back on the rebuilding side rather than the teardown side. So for me, I, I do fine with dairy. So I put a bunch of like cheap but very good quality whey protein into a blender with some fruit and some honey, and I get like a two to three, two to one, three to one ratio, and it works really well for me. It's gonna be what, very personally dependent. What about a, a deep fried cheese curd, like a quality cheese, you know, like a beer battered curd? I mean, it seems to me like I'm listening to myself talk, and that seems like an excellent recovery source. You got some dairy, yeah. and you got the beer batter in some type of oil. That can't be bad for you after a, a run. I mean, that's got to have something, right? And an yeah. IPA. No, you're kind of hitting a lot of the marks there. Honestly, you're hitting a bunch of the marks there. And isn't that isn't damn it like half bad, right? Like you're you're gonna get some protein from the cheese. You're gonna get whatever. Like there are people that are, and I'm one of them. that's gonna tell you like deep fried oil tends to not be the best, uh, mostly because of how long it's reused. But if you're making your own, fine. And then yeah, you get the carbs and beer. Alcohol is not the best, but it's also not the worst thing in the world. So yeah. Well, I'm not a high end <laughs> athlete either. So for me, that's kind of my fueling yeah. system at the end of a Same. after of a long a long run. You know, is something I good. So so with so recovery wise, and you know, I mean, there's not like I think again, there's not a magic pill. There's not a magic recipe. There's not a magic anything. Right. So does it come down really to the person? You know, yep. like what they what works for them. We're all built differently on how we do anything, right? So Correct. it's like you kind of find your own thing. And then I think you made a good point is like, what are you trying to recover, right? Mm-hmm. Is it Because you hear a lot of people, oh, I'm not as sore today. I had a, you know, I had a chocolate milk yesterday yeah. after my run. I'm not as sore. But, I mean, you could say, well, did you have a cool down? Did you do any stretching? Did you have, yeah. do any foam roll? All those things. But I, so I think there's like a lot of pieces, right? Yeah. So it's not like I just drank chocolate milk tomorrow. I'm going to be killer, right? I, yes. I mean, it seems like I'm. I feel that way most of the time. I have, yeah. a, I have a routine. Yeah. So is that kind of the same thing with like running? You find your routine that works for you. Um, not to say you can't look at somebody else and say, oh, they do that. Maybe I'll incorporate, but it's not right all the time. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's going to help a little bit as to what your overall, I mean, your overall intake matters more than anything else, right? Like it doesn't, if you were eating 30 grams of protein a day, that's really low for anybody who doesn't know. If you're eating 30 grams of protein a day, I don't care if all of that comes directly after your run, you're still not going to recover that well. Like we, everything works on averages and consistency and some level of like overall volume, right? Be it food, training, whatever. Um, and that's kind of where we end up here. And then if your overall intake is where it needs to be, then we can start to narrow in these like, are you getting the best benefits from 30 minutes post-workout, right? But if you're eating 1,000 calories under where you need to be 
for your training volume and your output, you're going to break. You're going to. <laughs> I don't. I don't care. Uh, it's not a matter of if. It's when. And like I can say this from personal experience. Like I overtrained in a caloric deficit forever, and it's one of the reasons I've been injured a lot. Like, I didn't know any better. I was in my early twenties. So I don't fault it. It's yeah. just like it's a physical fact. <laughs> well, I think you say that you're early twenties. So someone in like my I'm fifty. So there's going to be other markers, right, that I have to pay attention yeah. to, and even weight. If I'm heavier than I was five years ago, yeah. you know, my your body, your organs, your everything else, it, it does change. Yeah. So just because it worked or didn't work doesn't mean the opposite of those, yeah. right? And so Absolutely. I think it comes down to that same thing. So um, the one I'm interested in hearing a little bit about is the fasting side of things. Okay. I've, I've seen that, you know, more and more. It's like, oh, yeah. I fasted and, you know, I, I didn't dive deep into it. I understand, you know, kind of what it is, but like what are the pros and cons to fasting and why – for someone like me, why are people fasting for performance or better training or lifestyle? Sure. I think some of this comes down to like a misunderstanding and like what we qualify as fasting and all of that. So like, where, where are you on that front? So I can like answer the question for you and I can then also dive deep. Like what does fasting mean to you? What are you seeing? All that kind of stuff. Fasting to me means like not eating for two hours, right? <laughs> like I, I, I like, cool, I like right? food in front of me, but no, I yeah. see people say, you know, I, I, fa- I, I fasted for 12 hours. Mm-hmm. I fasted for 24 hours. Sure. I haven't really seen a lot after that. I know people do, but I mean, that's more what I'm looking at is why would you fast for 12? Mm-hmm. Why would you fast for 24? I think to me those are the ones I see the most of, and I again I don't follow people that do it. I don't read about it. It just it's really interesting to me. Yeah. And being someone that likes food, it's like I don't know why I'd want to. Yeah. Really. So what, are, what? What? That's why I was kind of curious, like the benefits and why people are doing it. Cool. So like when we we're gonna hit this from a few ends. So when I originally lost fifty pounds when I was twenty, right? I did that through a bunch of body weight training biking and intermittent fasting huge part of the component um like the original version of this (laughs) of uh, called the warrior diet by ori Ori mekloff and i like (laughs) and now like looking back on it it worked fine um partially because it was i was able to stay consistent with it because i was very busy so one meal a day worked fine for me I also don't really have an off switch, so I can put down 2,000 calories at a time. It's not really that hard for me. So all of that worked. Um, in retrospect, knowing what I do now, it was a, I mean, I was creating a calorie deficit in a way that worked. Right? Like that's, that's why I lost the weight. Um, you did, was it kind of like one of those things where you backed into it? It was like almost you did something, but it accidentally went like that. Yeah, like the, the correct calorie deficit or right, yeah, the right and I formula. Mean, that's what all these things do, right? Be, be it low fat of the '80s or keto now or whatever. Like you're creating calorie deficit. There's there are other benefits. There's other things they do. We can talk about like the positives and negatives to any of these diets from a like metabolic standpoint. If you're losing weight, you're in a calorie deficit, and if you're not, you're not, and. I know we're going to get to weight later, so just sh- short on that. Like The other thing that people misunderstand there, and as much as I will sometimes use a calorie tracker as a tool, they are not great <laughs> for a lot of people because your metabolism also adapts. So if you're in a caloric deficit for a long time, your metabolism will actually regulate downward to match that so that you don't die. So if you eat in a deficit for a long enough time, that will become like this new like base set gotcha. point. So you're right? kind of just reprogramming your body yeah. to a degree. Bingo. And that has side effects that are not always great. Um, but when I hear like I lost weight, you were by definition in a calorie deficit and you can create that any way you want. Right. And that's kind of where, where I was in my twenties. And the benefits to intermittent fasting can be, or fasting in general, right? So one of the things we talk about with fasting are like the health benefits and then the performance benefits and then the weight benefits. Cover the weight benefits. The health benefits are often come down to what's called like autophagy, which means like self-cleaning of your body systems, self-eating, right? So 
this became really popular, um, partially with the rise of keto and some other things. And we don't fully understand this process is one thing that kind of gets at me. And a lot of people act like it is very set science when it is still actively developing. Okay. Right? So we know that autophagy happens. We know like if you give your body a bit of a rest from intaking food, it'll kind of start to eat itself. And some of that process is some of it's bad. Like you might have muscle wasting if you do it long enough. Some of it's good. Um, it goes through self-cleaning processes like getting rid of your cancer cells and all that kind of stuff. Right? So there are these benefits to that. Those processes don't kick in solidly until you've been fasting for like 48, 72 hours, okay. somewhere in there. You, you'll get smaller doses daily, but that's where they really kick up. Okay. And then the other health benefits can be if you eat a giant meal before you go to bed, you're not going to sleep very well. Right. So if we can cut your feeding window a little shorter, you're probably not going to be pounding a bunch of food right before you go to sleep. So you might sleep a little better. Your cortisol and which is like your stress hormone that keeps you alive and motivated, um, which gets a lot of bad rap. It's a necessary thing that we need or else you'd never be awake. Right. <laughs> but like here, like ever, ever. <laughs> like if, you, if you don't have cortisol, you're asleep. Um, so your cortisol is a little higher in the morning, so you might digest certain things a little better in the morning. Um, you're a little more insulin sensitive, which most people know insulin because of diabetes. Also, necessary hormone. You need it to happen. But when you eat sugar all day long, it tends to go a little out of whack. right? So these benefits to fasting can keep you a little healthier. It becomes a little more of an issue when we look at it from a performance space, though, where if you are burning... 4,000 calories a day because you run uh, an amount like Jim Walmsley, then you need to eat that much food or else your body will fall apart. And you can put that into a couple meals or you can spread it throughout your day. It doesn't really matter for the most part. Um, but we need to like create that caloric balance if you want to perform well. right? And then if you are trying to use fasting we see the same thing from low carb where like fat fat adaptation or fat adapted mm -hmm. or any of this stuff yep. and this is another big thing here where a lot of people try to get more fat adapted to use more fat a higher ratio of fat during their race from a food standpoint and you can do that we don't see a lot of performance benefit from it so they've done studies like back to back on people there are changes that happen. You use a higher percentage of fat. We don't really see you go any faster with that. It might be a benefit um, in that you need to eat less on your race. Okay. So if you're doing something like, what was I staring at yesterday? Oh, the Bigfoot 40. Right? Okay. So you, you do this like long 40-mile loop through the middle of nowhere <laughs> around Man St. Helens. It looks like a beautiful race. I'd actually like to do it sometime. But there's two aid stations. Yeah. You need to carry a lot of food or else you're going to get stranded. Um, and if you're a little more fat adapted, something like that could be super helpful there. Yeah. Right. If you were trying to do an FKT in the middle of nowhere across the Appalachian, you might benefit from some fat adaptation like specifically so you don't have to carry as much food. But if you're doing the races most people are doing where there's an aid station every six miles and you have an opportunity to refuel and refill and all this stuff, it is not the best use of your time. And then we also end up with the longer you train, like up to a point, first five years or so, the more aerobically fit you get, the more fat adapted you get. So while this might be helpful for if you have a race with fewer aid stations or if you're trying to get a little bigger of an edge later it's not necessarily your it shouldn't be your first plan of attack so with that just because i i'm listening and i'm processing that like the fat adaptive so the other thing i look at when you were saying that the first thing i kept thinking was well if i'm fat adapted right for longer that means i'm probably not having to take food or gels as much yeah right and so could that help anywhere just based on because people's stomachs go south 
in 50s 100 milers right yeah. it's like oh my gosh i'm nauseous i can't have another gel so by not having to worry about fueling and i say worry about it but sure. you're adapted I mean, to it, it then that worry, could be yeah. a benefit right like yes i'm not putting things in my stomach to make my stomach sour and you know so therefore it's not just benefiting me because there's i don't have to carry as much you see that the fat adapt athletes they just got maybe a water bottle they don't carry a pack a belt they're not really needing it right yeah but they're also maybe is there a benefit about that whole stomach going bad right by you're not putting stuff in there yeah it absolutely can be right and it kind of depends on where you're coming from too so it's like someone who i've i've done time in keto i've originally lost a bunch of weight through intermittent fasting i'm not all that carb dependent um, I'll forget to eat till 4 p.m. sometimes um, just because I get busy. If you wake up and are starving, then you're probably a little insulin resistant, and that might be a larger benefit to you as well because you're a little more carb dependent than maybe you want to be. Okay. okay. And this is where we come back to your point about everybody's different and we're coming from a different place and we have kind of different goals. Um, from a pure for performance standpoint, yeah, it could help. Um, another thing that could help is you could get fitter. So if you have a better aerobic engine. That's hard. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know it is. I don't want the hard route. What's the magic pill? Right? What's the magic gel? <laughs> Oh, man, if I knew that, I would be a billionaire. <laughs> yeah. Oh, shit. But, like, I... <laughs> you could get fitter. Uh, you could train harder. And when you do those things, you'll also get more fat adapted. And if you feed yourself properly, you can also train harder to get fitter, right? So your training will be better. So there's, like, that cycle as well. There is that trade-off there. Um, that said, though, like, if you really struggle to make it more than a couple hours without food, which... I know you like you. We were in jest there, but like some people, I've I've definitely met who who are that way. They yeah. get like very hangry after two hours. Yeah. You're probably a little too carb dependent, and during a peak to a race is probably not the time to do this. But some point in your year, you might consider working a little more towards some fat adaptation and cutting out some carbohydrate. So that you lose a little bit of that insulin resistance. But at, and at the end of the day, though, like the, the stuff I do read, and I think carbs have a super bad name in general. I'm not saying they yes. do or don't deserve it, but they don't. In, but in general, yeah. like if you cut carbs, you're going to be for the. And I'm, I'm throwing this out there, but kind of healthier, right? Because it's like an inf inflammatory responses. Point, yeah. There's a lot of like carbs that are refined, you know, sugars, all these things. So if you are a little more careful yes. maybe is the right word with your carbs because people tell me ah, if, you, if we stop eating bread i'd lose so much weight or if you stop doing this i'm like well i think if you exercised and you did that maybe <laughs> yes. moderately you could probably do it as well so but i think there's there's a lot of truth to that i think carbs yeah. just have a really bad you hear carbs and people run the other way yes you know when i hear carbs i'm like dinner bell right <laughs> like give them i'll take them yeah i'll take your carbs that's all right to a degree i ate a bunch of potatoes like an hour ago it's <laughs> yeah. really great yeah, yeah. they're great i'm drinking beer right now it's absolutely fine <laughs> i feel 100 percent healthy and not inflamed i'm also going to run for two hours tomorrow <laughs> so you know those are those are corresponding factors yeah and i think i began but i think it goes to that point because you talk about i mean there's so many variables to nutrition yeah i think from any standpoint not to say it's not the training or anything else but to me nutrition is such a tricky thing right because it is it's like i'm going to be super serious with my training this year i'm going to really crack down on my so if you're doing all this at once if i change my daily diet if i change and up my training and i start strength training i'm gonna be out of whack like i'm not I, i've done it yeah. before where i've done the the whole food right so yeah. i did that on a training block i was exhausted and I remember I went to run with some friends and I was dizzy. And they're like, what happened? I'm like, well, I haven't eaten for a while. I'm like, dude, you need to eat some. So I grabbed a couple almonds thinking that was the <laughs> solve all because that was in my whole food 30 diet and it didn't quite work. I ended up walking uh, for a little ways. My body came around. But I think there is that process of don't do everything at once to the, the T, right? I mean, yeah. and I'm not saying... Again, it's everything, but I think for the most part, you can't hit it like, okay, hey, January 1, I'm going keto, my training's getting up to 50 miles a week, and I'm bit back in the gym. I think that's just a recipe yeah. for failure because you're going to get tired and I, I can't do this. Yeah, failure at best. You might get injured too, Yeah, which is super fun. And like this... Oh God, there's so much in there that like was just running through my brain. I just I just lob it up <laughs> no, and that's your it. turn to so, whack them. So, and I this 
love it. So we are looking at carbs from a, a whole like multifaceted perspective, right? So there's carbs are inflammatory if you eat too many of them. Anything is inflammatory if you eat too many of them. Based on our current like way of things and the food pyramid that has now been fairly debunked <laughs> and all this stuff, like there's a shitload of carbs everywhere. Yeah. It is way really easy to eat a lot of them. Yeah. Right. And not only are they carbs, um, so one, if you eat a bunch of carbs you don't use, you're gonna end up insulin resistant, inflamed, all this stuff. It leads to problems from cardiovascular disease to diabetes to pick a thing. Yeah. Um, it is a factor in cancer. It is a factor in every major disease. That does not mean carbs are bad. It means you should eat the amount that you're planning to use. Yeah. Right. And you don't need to go get a metabolic test. <laughs> you need to like keep an eye on your food occasionally. And most people need I don't know, less than they probably take in. Yeah. On oh, a I'm daily sure. basis. I think carbs are like the easiest thing and the tastiest things, right? I mean, they're yeah. easy to get to. They're probably it's inexpensive on the food chain, right? Yes. They're easy to get. It's like drive throughs I'm exactly. hungry. There's not healthy <laughs> exactly. choices. I got to eat. You go to a store, you got 10 bucks. Mm -hmm. I need to go as long as I can. I just bought two cases of ramen, yeah. right? But I didn't buy one healthy thing. So yeah. I think there's a lot of variables to that, and it's it's – hundred percent. We're seeing it, right? A Everywhere. Also, a lot of them also come with a bunch of excess fat. So like there's a, there's, <laughs> it's not the carb, right? Like there's, there's a few things that are all related here. So a sweet potato high in carbs. Mm -hmm. Most people don't think it's unhealthy, right? Like even whole 30 and paleo, like unless you're very keto, most people think a potato or a sweet potato is healthy. A potato is also healthy just for the record. Like it's very different. It has more potassium. It's a little like little starchier but not really like they're very they're both great you should eat a potato but like when we look at uh this stuff for weight loss so a lot of the times carbs come with fat a candy bar comes with a bunch of fat as well and it's really easy to put this down then we also end up with soda not demonizing soda if you like it occasionally have it like it's better than probably arguably the beer we're drinking but i disagree whatever with that. like i'm gonna I, cut that out of the show <laughs> <laughs> i mean i don't drink it but <laughs> i really don't it's not actually my taste i'd rather have a beer any day but like it's it's not inherently unhealthy it is that it is so easy to put down hundreds of calories of carbohydrate with no nutrition in yeah. there at all <laughs> and then when you cut out all your carbs um you tend to go towards some pretty micronutrient-dense foods because what's left, right? What is left is vegetables and protein and typically healthy fats if the, if the diet's constructed fairly well. So you end up fairly healthy. Now, if you're trying to do really heavy weightlifting or sprint work, you're going to bonk, like, immediately. <laughs> and it's going to hurt, and you're going to feel really drained. Right? And, like, I had this with an athlete about a year ago now where – he, a much better athlete than I'm ever going to be, um, very high level, like football player all the way through high school into a little bit of college, now runner and schemo and all this stuff. And he was getting all of his carbs, which was low, like 150 grams a day from quinoa and the occasional potato, super healthy diet. Um, but then he'd get two hours out into a ski touring adventure and he'd wonder why he had no energy left <laughs> like cause you, didn't eat, you didn't eat anything <laughs> he's not he's not all sucking day. the quinoa out of his between his teeth yeah like you didn't eat anything all day and you went to you you crashed at two hours and then you're such a good athlete that you managed to keep going for another four and enjoy your day because of how fun it was but i was just like man take a jar of honey with you and have like a teaspoon every 15 minutes after the first hour and his first response to me after that was, well, I've been demonizing sugar for years. Sugar is great. <laughs> I feel so good now. It was like a little oversimplified, but yeah, man, you have a carbohydrate in your system. Like it's fine. You're putting, you're out there for six hours. You are easily at the snow and the hiking and the skiing going to burn 5,000 calories today. Well, I always look forward to Coke in a, at yeah. near the end of a race at the aid station. If there's Coke, I always get that quick jolt. It's not the caffeine. It's just having yeah. some of that sugar. Or if I go too long, 
I finished a race before on Antelope Island. I laid down in the back of my car <laughs> be- until someone handed me a Coke. And yeah. then my, I started to feel better, right? Yeah. So I think there's all those things like you talk about. You can't, you can't look at everything big picture and also have other variables like you're talking yeah. about, like hardcore training, right? Compared yeah. to somebody that works in the office, goes home and doesn't do anything. Does, I mean, that's a different, that's a different cycle, yeah. right? So, but when you train, you have that. So, I mean, here's the thing. I love this and I knew this would happen with nutrition because there's just so much. And, sure. <clears throat> and so we're going to have you on again. Cool. Um, if you, if you, you know, that's your choice. I don't, I'll, I'll I don't, go. As there's long no as contract. Want, like, I, um, I'll talk about this till you're bored. <laughs> no, but I, I love having segments because what we did, um, for those that aren't aware, is on in social media, I posted the question that I was going to have a nutrition. Someone to talk nutrition on, and I had questions just coming in. Mm-hmm. So I don't want to not. So we'll, we'll go through these. Some we may have answered a little bit. Yeah. Um, but we've got like seven, seven or eight questions, and I know it might join another. So if you don't mind, you ready to tackle yeah, some of these? Um, so these are all from some great, um, I, I recognize so many names. So this is from Preston. Preston says, he says, the topic of weight and racing weight seems to be a hot topic these days. As a bigger runner, I know I'm at my best at a certain weight. However, there seems to be a lot of negativity associated with runners who want to lose weight. Why is it such a polarizing topic these days? Is there a space where runners who need to eat more and runners who need to be more conscious of what they are eating can coexist? Right? So this is kind of like, maybe not like a nutrition type, but I mean, you see it yeah. being in the gym and with athletes. Preston, you know, he's got one of those names. He's from, it's Preston Wood. He's been on the show. Mm-hmm. A f- fantastic runner, former football player, yeah. lineman. So his life has changed dramatically. Yeah. Um, so how, what, how, do you, how do you look at that? I know running, like being a heavier runner, he's like, oh, the Clydesdale division. Yeah. You know, the bigger, yeah, the bigger force. Right. And then you got the, the Wamsleys, right. Yeah. That, you know, the wind blows, he's going off the mountain and I'm still trekking right along the top yeah. of it, you know? So what's, what's your, what's your thought there? Yeah. I love this question. I hate this topic and I'll talk about it as much as you want. So <laughs> weight is, weight's hard. Um, kind of figure out where to line this from. It is a tough topic to discuss, and it is so sensitive because we have aligned weight with a bunch of other shit. Yeah. Be very blunt. Yeah. And as someone who... So I got into the ultra running space because I hated talking about weight loss. Um, There's other factors, right? Like I I told you I was helping people, and like that's really my whole goal here. But I hate talking about like weight loss publicly if you want to do it personally that's fine but as someone who is a was overweight and like over fat for my entire teenage years seeing a bunch of marketing media that says it like indiscript like indiscriptly says your fat piece of shit is not a thing i like yeah right and there are some people who do that very well um but it's a hard conversation to have Because your, like, moral worth is not related to your weight. Yeah. Right? And on the other end of that, though, we've swung really far the other direction where it's, like, if you don't have a bunch of extra fat, then you're probably going to be a little healthier for you. Right? Or if you don't have the habits that keep you there, you're going to be maybe a little healthier. Like, there's there are some things that the fat does. It makes your testosterone aromatized for example so you're not gonna have high testosterone all this kind of stuff but a lot of connection has also just been made with not necessarily the weight or the extra fat as much as it is like if you're eating 12 pounds of mcdonald's a day then it's probably not the healthiest for you whereas if you switch your diet up a little bit you might not lose a pound but you're still going to get healthier yeah right so that is kind of where we ended up in this space and it has been a backlash to what has been a really not pleasant um conversation from the other end for so long that now we've just like had had an acceptance movement that i generally really like i mm-hmm. just kind of appreciate the honesty from both ends yeah now from a running perspective weight doesn't matter so much um weight in proportion to your power output definitely does so and there is a point where weight's going to matter, period. Yeah. Right. So, like, I, I'm 5'7". I weigh 180. It's the heaviest I've weighed in, like, quite a long time. I've also, like, built so much muscle in my legs that I'm not... 
I'm actually struggling less than I ever have with this kind of stuff, yeah. right? Like I was getting injured more when I was 155. Um, my knees were worse when I was 155. It's because I've partially gained weight, but gained weight in the like muscular way yeah. that I've gotten better at this. That said, like if I were trying to like get on stage at bodybuilder competition and ended up at like 215, my knees would be livid. Yeah. Like, it's just not a, not a thing my frame could take very well. Yeah. Um, so there, there is a spot for you there. The other end is like, they've actually shown that maybe, um, extra muscle on your upper half can be a little more detrimental to Sweet. running than, Sweet. <laughs> than, Sweet. than even some of the extra fat, partially because like it doesn't need to be there. You should have some, yeah. right? Like muscle keeps you safe. It keeps whatever. Like I have a separated shoulder, a bunch of muscle in my shoulder. If I fall down, it keeps it safe. Yeah. Um, I also like to climb and do other shit, but like there is, there's a border there. The big thing that I think people end up with a problem here is if you were training for an event in the near future and you're in a peaking training cycle, you're in a heavy training cycle and you are in a caloric deficit, you're bound to get hurt, yeah. right? You cannot run 120 miles a week in a caloric deficit. You're going to get hurt. So this is why you see a lot of backlash to it because if you want to lose weight and it would be healthy for you or you want to lose fat specifically and it would be healthy for you, that's great. My life got a lot better from going from 205 to 155 when I was yeah. 20, right? My life would be, like, worse <laughs> if I had that extra weight. I'm not saying yours is if you're there, but that's me. Yeah. I really don't judge the desire to weight loss. I will say, if you are, like, coming up on a race in six weeks, it's the same, <laughs> same shit. Like, you should probably trim your strength training volume a little bit, too, so that you can focus on the running. You should feed yourself well enough so you can recover from the running. Yeah. And if you're, this becomes a little more relevant at like shorter distances too. If That's you're, cool. if you're trying to sprint an 800 meter, your weight matters a little more than if you're trying to run hundred miles, yeah. it'll, it'll largely even out over that distance. Nice. So as I said, happy to talk about this. <laughs> like it's, it's a very fueled topic and that's kind of why. All right. Next one is from uh, David. Uh, David, he's down South. He says best fueling options for people with diabetes. So I know David, he's been running for a while. He's put in some big, big runs and things like that. But what that's a great question. I you know, I wouldn't even begin to know. So best fueling options for people with diabetes. Yeah, it's a really good question. I'm gonna like lead off with I'm not a doctor or a registered dietitian, right? Like I'm a, I'm a coach and I'm pretty smart about food, but this is I'm not a clinician. So yeah. like there there's that. Um they have shown that when you are being really active, you do not tend to end up with as many glucose spikes as if you would be in your, your day-to-day sedentary life. So if you're, if you're currently running, the likelihood that you're going to end up with these gigantic spikes from a gel or a soda or whatever, much lower. Okay. So your fueling will probably be, be fairly similar to someone else. That said, in your day-to-day, it is probably going to be a little different. And that's something, too, I think, is you kind of, you don't go from one to the other like that. Like you'd probably mm. dabble maybe like a half a gel, yeah, right? Or exactly. a quarter of a gel and see just kind of how you feel. But yeah. would it also depend on your your output? Yeah. So like if you were doing crazy vert as yeah. you know, as opposed to a flat run, right? Yes. So I think with that one, just the, and that could go I mean, that's across the board, 100%. right? But I mean that's probably the best way is kinda like just incrementally fill that out, right? Yeah. I mean, I think that I tend to view fueling during a race like you're trying to mimic an IV and this is for everybody. Like your, your hydration should be very consistent. Your salt should be very consistent and you don't quite know what's coming out of you. So that's really tough to do, but sometimes you really know what's coming out of you. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. <laughs> but like, you, know, <laughs> you don't know exactly what you're expecting. So yeah. it's like tough to, tough to make that happen. But like theoretically you'd be better off like putting an IV in your arm and running the race. Like if, if it wouldn't impede your motion. Yeah. Um, and the most you can, the best you can mimic that with food, the better. And while most people will have more leniency in that, if you have a very sensitive stomach or you are diabetic or have any of these things, you just, it's going to need to be a lot more consistent. You're just going to need to be a lot more on point. And if you're really worried, I would consider getting a CGM, a continuous glucose monitor. You can get them from places like NutriSense and Levels for like 100, 200 bucks now and go put one on and see what it does to you during the race. And 
if you see what it does to you like once or twice, it'll be, it should be pretty consistent. Okay. That's great. That's great. Yeah. Uh, next up, we've got Missy uh, from California. She says, I have a tough time taking in solid foods during training and races because of my constant dry mouth. What are some good options to help break up the gel fatigue that happens? Cool. So two ends. I, if you have constant dry mouth, I have a strong suspicion you're dehydrated. So a lot of nutrition issues are hydration issues. So if you haven't considered like doing a sweat test and Eric and I'll talk about this right at the end, but like I have a, I have a guide for this, like we can get that done, but consider doing a sweat test and see what your like actual fluid intakes might need. Cause if you are dry mouthed, you probably need to hydrate a little more. Um, and that should make your food intake a little easier. Now, some people just have that tendency a little more, um, or, if you're running in really dry climates, like I lived in Tucson, Arizona for six years, like it didn't matter how much I, I yeah. intook, like I'm going to have some dry mouth. Um, She's I, from California, like yeah. the, the hot, <clears throat> dry, yeah. deserty thing. I th- I'm pretty sure. <laughs> yeah. All the pictures she posted, it looks hot and dry. <laughs> yeah, man. So like really make sure your hydration's on point would be my first thing. And then second, um, if you can't intake solid foods and you struggle with the palate fatigue, I actually really like um, unflavored products a lot. So I kind of hack a lot of my um, liquid nutrition. I buy pure maltodextrin off of Amazon because like $13 for two pounds. I'm also just cheap. <laughs> and then I, I'll buy like... <clears throat> called highly branched cyclic dextrin it's also called cluster dextrin it's what's in scratches super fuel <coughs> sorry it's what's in scratches super fuel and you can buy that purely on amazon as well it doesn't taste like anything and you can just put it in liquid um and you can make a very like concentrated solution of that so you don't have to drink that much of it and then you can have your hydration and your nutrition separated by a bit of a barrier even though they're both this like liquid product. So okay. that would be one way to do it. And then I know Tailwind also makes um, unflavored product as do a bunch of other things as well. So that'd be a one way to go. That's a great point. I never actually, you, that you say that, I never thought of that because flavor sometimes gets you. It's oh, like it's super exhausting. sugary or, you know, your favorite flavor turns into the flavor you'll never eat ever again after a race. Oh, yeah. like you when, know? when I was cycling like many miles a week, like there weren't, there weren't as many options. Yeah. Right? Like it was right to scratch was coming out, but the main ones were like glue and or goo and cliff and they worked great. But like if I ever... <laughs> taste a couple of those flavors again i'm gonna murder someone. oh yeah like, i just I, can't do it i've had bad reactions mm-hmm. I, I hear a flavor and i kind of get the bad feeling yeah um all right here we go um some again i think some of these two are, are tricky um just because you don't know sure lifestyle people <clears throat> um best meal the night before a long run or a long ultra so like a night before what's a good meal and i know that one's a to me, it's a loaded question. I heard yeah. someone today I talked to him like, oh, the night before races, I do pancakes and scrambled eggs. And yeah. I'm like, huh, never thought of breakfast before. <laughs> like, I mean, I love it, but what what are some good long meals before a run? Because it used to be, man, you got to go to a bunch of spaghetti. Yep. Right? Yes. Um, so couple factors here the the carb loading thing is real it was also overplayed like as anybody who played sports when they were young like younger like i'm sure you've eaten one of those giant pasta dinners and then felt like garbage on on game day um don't do that so carb loading helps the way to do it properly is to slightly increase your carb intake the entire day prior to your race and not not a big huge dump yeah exactly (laughs) so you're not trying to eat like three pounds of pasta the night before you might have like an extra pancake at breakfast on Friday, you know, like an extra piece of bread at lunch on Friday, and then like an extra helping of rice on Friday night or something like that, and they'll get you there. And then just kind of top yourself off Saturday. So carb loading is your glycogen stores are replenished on like a 24 to 36 hour period. So like starting Thursday night, just slightly increase your carbohydrate intake, and then you should be good by Saturday morning. The other thing people worry about is fiber so there's a a lot to fiber it is a kind of a complicated topic and it does seem to be very personally dependent um certain types of fiber will make you go to the bathroom faster certain types of fiber will like back you up a little more um you probably want less fiber on friday if your race is on saturday the exact amount i don't know like you really want just enough to go poop 
yeah. on Saturday morning and that's about it, man. Like, and so not a, not a ton of vegetables the night before, um, a little bit more on the carbohydrate front and then a meal that will honestly be comforting and relaxing and help you sleep. Cause if you don't sleep the night before, that's a big one. And like all of us have had those, those nights where you can't sleep before a big event and it sucks. So yeah. something that kind of winds you down can help too. Okay. That was from Stephanie, by the way, the next one is from Thomas and his kind of is pretty similar. He it says best pre-race food. I don't, eat much before early morning training runs but feel more empty on longer runs with maybe a bit more effort so what's like a like you wake up either you have a race or you've got your long run and you know you're probably going to put more effort than a normal training day it sounds like what is like a good something to have in your stomach to start off yeah i wouldn't start too heavy so during race or anything unless you're going really slow you don't want a lot of fat or fiber Um, both of those take a long time to exit your stomach they can take like three to four hours. So unless you're really fit or kind of cruising at a pretty slow pace, like you don't want anything super fatty or fibrous or anything like that. Carbohydrates are going to be kind of your friend here. Um, and maybe a little bit of protein to kind of mitigate some damage. But the, the big thing is going to be a little bit on the carbohydrate front. I like a banana or two, maybe. Some people do find it the bagel. Um some people do bagel and cream cheese, like, but the big thing is going to be get some fuel in you. And if you are doing work for like less than an hour, it's not as necessary. So it makes some sense that you're not hitting that point. But if you're on a longer effort, start fueling and start fueling early and carbohydrates really your friend. What about pop tarts? Yeah. That, right. used, that you actually, <laughs> for real, used to be my go-to for a long time. I'd have raspberry pop tarts. One of my current athletes has a pop tart too. It's, oh, yeah, really? it's gold time. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I tasted good. They weren't heavy. Yeah. But I mean, I don't know. Who knew? Who yeah. knows? I don't know, but they 100%. were good. I mean, honestly, if it sits well in your stomach and it's a little fueling, I like a banana and or a potato because they both have some bonus potassium in them, which can help with muscle contractions and cramping and all sorts of stuff. But if it has some carbohydrate in it and sits well with you, it's a pretty good way to go. And honestly, most people could start earlier than they do. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Next one. Um, I tend to eat dinner right before I go to bed. And every night I seem to run extremely hot and cannot sleep. What is something? Is it something I'm eating, something I'm doing, or something I can do differently? You could eat dinner earlier would be the answer here. Now, I realize timing can be tough. Um, as I mentioned, I worked ski resorts and grooming. So I worked the night shift for like six winter, five winters in a row. And so I'd, <laughs> I'd come home, slam food, and then go to bed um, at like 1 p.m. So it's it's hard sometimes depending on your work. But the the thing that's going on there is your body is – digesting food when you're digesting food your temperature is going to be somewhat elevated so you're not going to be able to rest as well so eat a little earlier give yourself a bit of a, a time break um if you have the money you could get a device like an uler or a chili pad that goes on your bed to cool the bed i think eight sleep has another one you could crank the ac but really the answer food wise is going to be eat earlier now you might also have some food sensitivities, right? So if you if you were a celiac and you had gluten, that's going to raise your temperature because your body's freaking out trying to get rid of it. Um, if you have a bunch of alcohol, that'll also raise your temperature. Um, that's one of the reasons alcohol affects your sleep is because it raises your core temperature while your body, your liver is trying to process it. Um, that's another one. I am really good with dairy most of the time, but I have a slight sensitivity to casein. So if I have a casein protein powder, my temperature... Like, raises notably and I can't sleep so you might have a sensitivity issue but my guess based on it was in your question is you're eating too close to bedtime your body is digesting and it's like taking a few hours especially if it's dinner if you eat dinner like dinner with like weird beer yeah. wine or something <laughs> yeah. late and it's probably your biggest meal of the day because it is for most of us you're probably eating near a thousand calories at night and then trying to go to sleep and it's kicking you okay awesome um, and I, as I said, I empathize. That's why I have a lot of those tools. Cause like I had no time to eat working an 80 hour week night shift. So there's some other stuff. Feel free to reach out to me. I can help you hack it a little bit, but that's the big one. Okay. Next one's from Benjamin. Oh, we kind of covered this one, but again, we'll, mm. we'll touch it because we'll maybe a little pointed. Yeah. 
best way to drop weight but train? I need to drop weight but don't want to be tired and lack energy. Also, I would like to build muscle and not hurt it. Um, I mean, based on what that, you said earlier, yeah. how, how possible is that? You're cutting a fine line through all of those things. You're probably not going to achieve all those things at once, right? So that's the really blunt answer. Um, we can do some of that. So if you're trying to drop weight and train, a really good way to be in there is um, trying to do like an aerobic base function um, block. So you're not going to have a bunch of intensity. You're not going to risk like over leveraging yourself, any of that. So trying to work a little bit on your on your base, low and slow, keeping your heart rate low, just you can put in a bunch of volume that way. You can run really frequently. You just like can't crank the intensity. Okay. Um, that's going to be one. If your primary focus is weight loss, then running is actually not going to be your best friend right now. Um, probably, depending on your background. For most people, the best way to target weight loss is actually cut the cardio for a little while um, to whatever a base would be for you. So if you think you can run 15 miles a week for the rest of your entire life, then that's fine. But for most people, it's probably not you're going to have an off week, right? So like pick whatever your very minimum is, kind of stick with that, really target strength training for a little while, build some muscle because that will raise your metabolism. It'll teach your body to be a little less efficient. And then once you get to that space, then you can go into a cut by increasing your cardio and making it a little easier. Like it'll function melt off once you're there. Okay. Um, and then the strength aspect Trying to gain muscle. So this is the real thing. You're not going to lose fat and gain muscle at the same time unless you are very new to training. We have You have a period of like a year, year and a half, what we call in the industry like newbie gains, where you can just leverage your body's like complete inexperience. If you've been training longer than that, it's just not going to happen. Um, you should pick something and stick with it for a couple months and then like target another goal. So if you really want to get better at running or like work on your run training, then find, find a bit of a deficit, target that aerobic like low intensity so you don't hurt yourself, or like target some strength. You can do that <coughs> in a bit of a surplus, target the deficit later, or you can also increase your protein a little bit higher than like what would be normal. Um, that will help with muscle loss prevention so you can maintain the muscle you have while you go into that deficit but short answer you're trying to do too much at one time and we need to prioritize a little bit and you can achieve all those goals within the round of like six 12 months but trying to do all that at once means you're going to do all of them fairly badly gotcha so would it be for something like that it seems to me like when you say not all at once maybe like you just deal with it right if you're training now you deal with it yeah. whatever happens then when you're quote unquote seasons over then you focus a little more on the weight loss side before you ramp back up for your next round or season maybe something yeah, like that exactly. where you're not focused I mean, on both at the same time yeah I mean okay. for me I'm a little heavier than I'd like to be but I'm kind of accepting it and I'm going to like move into this like running period for the next few months and see what happens like if weight loss happens a little bit with the increase in volume fine but it's not going to be a target and then winter is going to be more my off season from running and then that would be like a strength building and maybe weight loss phase, like not at the same time, but cycled. So like a strength build a little first, then lose a little weight, then get back to the running. Like it's how a year planning would kind of work. Okay. But your year needs to be in seasons. You have in season, which is whatever you care about. And weight loss is probably not going to happen then <laughs> um, unless you're <clears throat> like a competitive fighter. And that's what makes those like weight cuts so ridiculous. Yeah. Um, it's also why most of that weight loss is not fat. They drop like 12 pounds in a week due to water manipulation. Like they cut all their sodium, they cut all their carbs, and then they like leverage hormones to like bleed 10 pounds the night before, and it's all water manipulation. So <laughs> it sucks. <Yeah. laughs> so <laughs> like um, unless you really just care about the scale and willing to like play with your water like a fighter, if you care about fat loss, then we need to like periodize your year a little bit. Well, because the water thing is not – it's – temporary yeah, too right so it's like it's a, it's a number so you look at a scale you're proud two days later you're probably a pound above that bingo i mean i can fluctuate to five pounds in the night like if i'm dehydrated because i drink a bunch of water every day 
And yeah, the, this is another reason why weight is a struggle. Yeah. Right? Like it's really common for people to do a weight loss challenge and they'll lose a bunch of weight. But if they get their body fat percentage, it might actually go up because they'll lose muscle in the process. So yeah. we need to have our like end goals and priorities and all that stuff in line. Well, this is the last one that came in, um, and this is actually a pretty good one, to be honest with you. Um, when your stomach, this is from Alan, when mm. your stomach goes south, what's the best way to bring it back? Slow down. Yeah. <laughs> it's, really, it's really it. Um, if your stomach goes south, there's a whole bunch of stuff that could be going on. You could be dehydrated. You could like be out of salt balance. You could have eaten something a little too fatty so that it sits in your stomach a little too long. Um, and it's not emptying out of your stomach and getting where it needs to be, right? Um, the answer to pretty much all of those things is in the moment is to slow down, walk, or like power hike, but probably walk for like 20 minutes, get your hydration levels all stable, and then get back to it. And this is a place where like, if you need to walk at you know, a 20-minute mile for a mile, and then you can get back to running. Awesome. Whereas if you keep trying to fight this through and you end up in nausea and vomiting and then you can't eat food for the rest of your race, you might have dropped your like pace for 50 miles <laughs> way down. So just like I'll tell some athletes, like take an unplanned rest day if you really need to to prevent the injury down the line. It's the same here. And like I was telling a story that like I was, I was an idiot on a long run. Like I was fighting a water bottle for like a quarter mile and it like dropped my pace for that long. Whereas I could have just taken three Stopped. seconds to like, pull it out of my vest yeah. and then put it back in. Um, same concept here. Like just slow down, have a little hydration, let your stomach settle and then get back to it. So what if you do get to that point you just talked about? What if you get to that nauseous point or you even do throw up? Because I've done that where I'm just, yeah. I'm already nauseous. Like there's just like, I'm sick. I don't feel good. You got to eat something. Nope. You got to do this. Nope. I mean, what happens? The same thing. Do you slow down? Is there, you know, because I know another thing that goes around a lot is like a ginger chew, you know, to get some ginger in your stomach. Ginger ale, obviously, um, and ultras is an easy way. Um, is there anything once you feel it like, oh, I'm getting, I'm getting nauseous? Yeah, so step one, again, would be slow down for a little bit and kind of reset. The reason you get nauseous most of the time um, is all of your blood's in your legs and you don't have enough blood volume for your stomach, right? So if we can get some of that blood back to our stomach, it will digest a little better and we can get back to running. So handstands. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> <laughs> uh, bunch of crunches to like push the fl flow of blood there. Uh, but like for real, you're probably dehydrated. Um, some people are at a, a bigger deficit here. If you sweat really heavy, you might just be dehydrated. You might have a bigger issue for stomach problems. Um, it's very personally dependent. It's one of the first things I do with athletes is try to figure out your race day nutrition. It's there's like two things you can do to get faster to race with very little effort. It's like figure out your race day nutrition and hydration and figure out how to get through an aid station faster. Oh, yeah. Right? Like, so if we can, that's one of the first things I do with people. But if we're looking at, oh, you're, you're, you're sour, you're in the problem, it's going to be slow down. See what your hydration's like. If you aren't peeing, we need to fix that. If your pee is like golden, we need to fix that too. You're probably dehydrated. Um, are you having enough salt? Are your hands swollen? So like... Are we having a like hypernatremia, hyponatremia kind of spectrum? Like, where are we there? If your hydration is pretty good, probably need to settle a little bit. What did you eat recently? If it was fattier, like, I love peanut butter, but it's not a thing I could eat during a race. It's going to make me throw up. Um, I really like the company Spring Energy Gels, but oh, yeah. like some of their gels are not for me until I start to get fitter. Like, what is it's like it's speed a, nut speed, um, speed nuts nut like 240 calories and it, uh, it's 20 grams of fat it's great especially if you're really fit or on a longer effort but if you're trying to push a little harder it's probably going to sit there and you're gonna have some problems so what did you eat recently where are we on the um digestion spectrum what does it feel like kind of reassess and get back to it so okay. that's really where it is but the first step is slow down assess and like get your hydration in order so that's that's it for the questions um, we do encourage listeners to send questions in. So manners at trailmanners.com because the goal is to have him on again um, so we can answer more. I mean, the more education we can get out there, the more help we can do is be best. So if you have any questions, you can email those at manners at trailmanners.com. Um, I mean, that's kind of the topics, but 
based on everything we've talked about, trends in topics, trends in our, our conversation, what are some other things um, that we missed that you think, that you see with your athletes, with, with the you know the nutrition side? What are things that we potentially could have missed or we could touch on real quick before we go? Yeah, so th- these are kind of longer topics we can do later, but um, day-to-day nutrition is a big one. Like, Where should that be? How can we maybe like periodize throughout, throughout the year? And that's going to be really personally dependent, so I'd actually love some like individual questions on this. Yeah. Right? Um, and then... How, how do you create a hydration strategy? Like my first recommendation for people is figure out your sweat rate mm-hmm. and do it a few times a year. <clears throat> if you are, if you were guessing blindly at how much fluid intake you need and you have stomach problems, don't do that anymore. So where <laughs> like, would somebody do that? Like if they were interested yeah. in doing like that yeah. test. Um, and you can go to, that Facebook group that I have called trail and ultra running nutrition. And there's a, there's a guide in there on this, but short version is like weigh yourself naked before you got for a run, go run, weigh yourself naked when you come back. The difference is how much sweat you lost more or less. So would you height, would you drink water? I mean, would you you go fast it or how would you, if you want to, it's fine. Like for most people, probably to keep yourself safe, especially if you're running outside. Right. So like you don't want to get trapped with that water. Um, and then just subtract whatever water you intook. Okay. Right? So like that'd be a good way to do it too. And then do that a few times throughout the year. Um, cause your sweat rate's going to be different in January than it will be in June. Oh yeah. Especially here. Like it, we don't live in beautiful coastal California. It is a hundred degree temperature swing between yeah. those two. So, so there's, so somewhere to go to find that, that, uh, what is it? A, a guide. Yeah. Um, what the group? Yeah. Trail and ultra running nutrition. Okay. Or you can go to my website or whatever, which I'll give you to put in show notes and we can do whatever. Okay. But, so yeah, we'll put that in the show notes. We'll put both of them in the show notes just to make it easier for those that are, that are listening and, and potentially driving. But again, if there are questions, you know, please send them in. Um, I think, you know, throughout the year, this is a topic we will keep discussing on the nutrition side. You know, there's a few that we'll come back to quite a bit. Um, you know, on the show, whether it's, you know, we got some strength training stuff, we got some of this, um, we're actually going to also talk to some uh, nutrition companies, you know, to kind of just figure out their stuff through. So there's going to be a lot of, a lot of information coming through. So the more questions to send in, the better we can, um, set these up, uh, for the listener. Um, but we'll thank you so much uh, for coming on. We've tried to set this up for a while. (laughs) Unfortunately on my end, it's been a drag, uh, working on some new studio stuff, I guess is the best way to put it. Um, but you did raise the guest game a little bit um, by bringing in some IPAs I've never had, which is always a plus, and cheese curds. I mean, that's that's the guest game has risen. And that's one of my fears with going to these online <laughs> podcasts because it's hard to get together with people. There's so many people across the country. It's going to be hard to get this. I have to supply my own stuff, and it's going to be the same stuff I always have. So it's going to be a bummer, but... Uh, but yeah, seriously, thanks for coming down. Uh, truly appreciate yeah. all this information. And I know li- we literally scratched the surface pretty much on everything. I mean, each thing we talked about from fasting to keto to nutrition to hydration to all this stuff is just show up on show yeah. um, if we really wanted to tackle it. That's why these questions are, are pretty good um, so we can kind of get a little more uh, tuned in and and. and you know, targeted, I guess is the best way to put it. But at the end of yeah. the day too, everybody's different. So oh, for sure. what was said may work for one and may work differently for another. And then just like you and I were chatting, I don't think I actually said this on the podcast, but an ultra is like 12 different events, right? Yeah. Like you're not going to fuel a 50 K the same as you will to six day or I might've mentioned that, but like that's, that's a real thing yeah. that we should recognize. Like whatever your training is, whatever your fitness ground is, whatever your background is, it's, it's very individually dependent based on your needs. And then also like, what you're actually doing <laughs> and where you are in your training cycle. So it's, it's hard. Well, and you got the weather component, summer oh versus God. winter. You've got oh, the yeah, elevation. We talk about heat and altitude at some point. Yeah. <laughs> you got the elevation component. You've got, you know, is it your first ever, you know, ultra 50 K yep. say, is it yeah. your first ever, you know, and how people ask me all the time, well, how much harder is a 50 K than a marathon? Like they're, you know, seven, you know, yeah. it's whatever miles, but how much harder I'm like, they're, they're, everything's harder. I yeah. don't care if you're doing 28 miles. You know what yeah. I mean? It's like Some, somebody asked me that the other day and I was like, you probably have the aerobic fitness to do a 50 K if you have done a marathon, but you, you're going to be running mountains. So you probably need to get your legs might need to be stronger and you need to get your hydration and nutrition plan down. Yeah. Like that's going to be the big difference for sure. Yeah. So, but yeah, thanks for, thanks again for coming down. Thanks for talking about it. 
um, there'll be links in the show notes there. Um, you can check them out at um, trailmanners.com, plus wherever you listen to the podcast on the multitude of places the podcasts are shown. Um, but thanks for taking your time yeah. uh, to come down. We'll definitely get you back on the show. Um, and yeah, keep those questions coming and uh, be ready for uh, for more fun uh, this year with the Trail Manners podcast. So, uh, Will, thanks again. I'm Eric Manning, and uh, we are out. Thank you for listening to the Trail Manners Podcast. I'd like to thank Will Franz for joining us today. Make sure you check out the show notes for some interesting and educational links to help you out along your way. I also want to encourage everybody to follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, Trail Manners. You can also check out our store page and support the podcast by checking out a t-shirt or whatever else is still on there. Or you can hit us up on the contact page. Let me know what you want to see, who you want to hear, or if you would like to be on the show. And besides, I always love hearing from you. And lastly, Trail Manners would love your support via our Patreon account, patreon.com backslash trail manners. Until next time, this is Eric Manning reminding you, you don't get what you wish for, you get what you work for. Now go get it. <laughs>